right. <clears throat> Good evening to everyone. I'm very glad to have you with us tonight for another installment of our Bible study. Um, we'll be waiting as usual. You guys know I'm a little bit ahead of you. So I'm going to wait till I get the notifications that we're on. I will send you our study guide for tonight. And then we will get into our study of Revelation chapter 19. We're going to pick up at verse number 14 and move through to verse number 16 today. Uh, verses 14 through 16. A lot of meat, a uh, lot that we want to cover as we continue to build on these series. Uh, one lesson after another. Last week we talked about uh, right on King Jesus um, and how we identify the king um, riding in on his white horse, the Lion King of the tribe of Judah. We're thankful I have the notification that we are indeed on. So let me get, let me get our, let me get our uh, study guide in and then we'll get to going on the lesson today. I pray that you all are having an awesome day, an awesome evening. I pray that you all are blessed in the Lord. Uh, pace. Okay, hold on. I didn't copy it right. <clears throat> and then we'll get you going. There we go. So our Facebook crew is in. We got your uh, outline tonight. Let me take care of our YouTube crew. And then we will be ready to begin. All right. So we got a study. Uh, we got a study guides in for both groups. Um, let's get ready to pray so we can move forward in our study. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we bless you, and we thank you for another opportunity, another e evening that we have set aside uh, that you're going to speak to us tonight. We thank you because your word declares. Uh, that those who read this book will be blessed. So we thank you that the time we spend together tonight will be a time that we be blessed. We're honored to have the privilege to stand before your people with your word. And, and so, God, we stand uh, now asking for you to give us all revelation knowledge, asking you, O oh God, to guide us in all wisdom as it pertains to your word, that we speak all truth, no error, we pray right now, God, that you, the rabbi, the master teacher, will teach us all those things as pertains to your word, God. We're listening. We're eager. We're excited. We're anticipating a word from you, God. So speak to us on tonight. We thank you for everyone who is here right now, everyone who will be coming on. Everyone will watch, that will watch this later, we ask that you'll bless them and keep them, meet them at their very points of need, God. We're just so grateful tonight for the power of your word. We're thankful to study about our soon coming king. So we give you all glory, all honor, all praise because it belongs to you and no one else. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening to all of you. I see some of you that are here already. Sister Robinson and Sister Harris, Sister Blackman, Sister Autry. God bless you all on tonight. Let's get to work on the study, though, yeah? All right, let's go to work. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, I will begin reading at verse number 14 and moving us through to verse number 16. Um, but I'll start reading at verse number 11 for context, just because that's where we started last week. So let's go. It says, verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and make war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head he wore many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. 
He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the rime press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's go to work here on our Lion King series, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You have your outline if you want to follow along with us. So let's go. Our lesson today is the plan coming together. The plan is coming together. Last week we studied. Let's get let's just touch on last week just just a tad. Last week we studied about how Jesus Christ was the king of glory and how he rode on this white horse and we saw him in all of his glory and all of his majesty. Uh, he's faithful. He's true. He's called the word of God. His robe was dipped in blood. We learned that he was the lion and when John got the vision, it wasn't for anyone to get into heaven. It was for Jesus to come out and so it was time for the king to come and set up his reign and set up himself as the king of kings, his rightful place. Now here's what's interesting though. Let me give a news flash though as we talked about Christ coming as we talked about really 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 the 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 the, the power of the lion king right we learn about that in Genesis 49 here's what I want to tell you news flash here it is here it is here it is here it is Christ is not coming back so he can be the king hear, hear, hear me very closely the, the, these lessons are, are this, this section of scripture is not us saying Christ is coming back to be the king. He's not coming back to be the king. He's already the king. <laughs> Matter of fact, we said last week, he's the king over everywhere and everybody. It is not about Christ coming to be the king. It's about Christ coming, right, to take his rightful place as the king. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 33. It's right here in your notes. Verse number 17, it says, you will see the king in his beauty. We talked about the king, right? But there, the majesty, the Lord will be for us. A place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail, no majestic ships pass by. For the Lord, look at this, is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Here's the key. And he will save us. Us. This is the moment last week that we said that everybody's been waiting for. More specifically now, people of God, this is the time, this return of Christ is mandatory because it's part of the plan of God. As Titus 1 and 2 said, the, the, the God who promised us a full and complete salvation and he will not lie about it. He cannot lie about it. So right now we're going to study tonight really, really, really the power of the redemptive work of God through his son Christ to complete our salvation. And the, the moment of him reigning as king only is part of the fulfillment of that plan. It must happen. Christ must come back and reign as king. It must happen. Now, here's what's interesting here, right? This plan that God had, he had it all the way from the beginning. The redemptive story of mankind, humankind, humanity, whatever word you want to use, started in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And since then, God has been working his way back. He's been pursuing us. He's been bringing us back to himself ever since. Do you not know something interesting before we keep moving forward? That if it was not for sin, there would be no Bible. Like the whole function of the Bible, the whole purpose of the Bible will be null and void had there not been any sin. Okay, the Bible is the revelation of God. That's what the Bible says. This book right here is designed to give us the keys to unlock us to the pathway of salvation. It is the redemptive story of God. It is the revelation of God through his son Christ to bring us back to him. That's all this book is about. It's about Christ bringing us back. Now here's what's powerful here. Here's what's powerful here. If it was no sin, we would not need a rev written revelation of God. We would already have it. So the whole purpose of Christ coming to be king, as I repeat, 
purposely to be redundant is that he's not coming back to be a king. He's already the king. He's coming back to establish or he's coming back to reestablish an Eden-like environment, an Eden-like atmosphere where we're under the power of God, the rulership of God, the dominion of God, and nothing is blocking us from being in perfect harmony and perfect relationship with him. That's why this uh, that's why this Lion King teaching is so important. That's why Christ coming back is so important because it's really about completing the salvation or the redemption of mankind. That's the power in this, right? First John 3 and 8, the Bible says that Christ has come to destroy the works of the devil because <laughs> he sinned from the beginning. The Bible says in Acts chapter 15, verse 18, that the plans of God is eternal. This is not some uh, happenstance. This is not some reroute. This is not some accident. This is not some plan B. This return of Christ, the Lion King, the King of, of, of all things, right? This is part of God's intricate and perfect eternal plan from the beginning of time. From the beginning of time. Right? So look here, look here. Let's go to work here. So we're going to talk about this. And really, really what this lesson is going to bring us into, this lesson is going to usher us into um, the work as it pertains to uh, the battle of Armageddon. We're going to talk about that next week. The battle of Armageddon is very fascinating stuff, right? And so what you're going to find right now here is that Christ is getting ready to prepare himself to engage in the final battle, the battle that will destroy, the battle that will get rid of, the battle that will consume all wickedness for all time. The battle places Armageddon. We already identified Christ as the king, the victorious king, right? And now we're going to talk about the heavenly troops. In verse number 14, those who will be riding with him. And then we're going to talk about really the power of God and how he works so wonderful. Let me read something out of Isaiah 66 and we'll get to the text. It's right here in your notes, right? That in this text, we're going to unleash a massive weapon that Christ is going to use. Watch, 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 watch. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, by his word, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. This prophetic word that Isaiah spoke many, many years ago is now in fruition here in this poetic and beautiful revelation that John sees. Let's start the work here in verse number 14. Come with me right here. Here's what verse 14 says. It says, and, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Hallelujah. Here we go. So now we're going to talk about this battle, Armageddon, a little bit more next week, but let me give you a reference here. So you understand that this final battle between wickedness and, and righteousness will take place in the battle of Armageddon. We'll look at that in verse 17. But it talks about Christ, who is the victorious one, the captain of the army, the, the, the Lord of hosts, the most awesome and powerful king. Now we're going to see something powerful here. That it says in this text that there's armies in heaven with them. There's stoles that are going to come with them. So look at here. Look at here. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 16 with me. Come to Revelation 16 with me. We want to see first who God is going to be fighting against, right? Let, 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 let's get a look at who God's going to be fighting against. Who is Christ? going to meet in this battle, this, this plan. Now, 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 the people that he's going to fight in this battle, their job and their purpose is to block us from the redemptive work of Christ. All the devil has been doing all throughout biblical history is to block us from salvation. That's his job. His job is to try to make the Bible look untrue. Look right here. Look right here. Revelation 16, verse number 12. Well, let's, let's, let's start at verse number 10. It says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed at their tongues because of the pain. We talked about this, a darkness that you can literally feel. They blasphemed the God of heaven, 
because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent. Pretty sad, ain't it? Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, which is the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth. Whoa, don't miss it. I just told you here, we read, that there was a way being made for the kings of the east to make their way. Now, as we read further, it's saying now the kings of the earth and the whole world. Why? To gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watch and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place in the Hebrew called Armageddon. Oh God, we're going to get, oh God, this is powerful. Watch. So now we see that the unholy trinity, right? Satan, the antichrist and the false prophet have released some demonic influence and have gotten people all excited about traveling in the darkness. We just read that the, that the, that the whole kingdom of the antichrist at this time, the whole world is not given its light. It is dark. Men are full with sores. The sun is scorching folks. And God made a way, dried up the youth phrase we studied this come on look at some of the previous lessons uh our revelation 16 lesson will explain this in more detail right they make their way to this place so now we have the antichrist satan the beast these demonic forces these 200 million demons who have been released from the river euphrates every king in the earth every king in the whole world now have gathered themselves together to fight God. That's who God is going up against. That's who the king is going to be battling. The Lion King is preparing for battle against Satan, wickedness, and the whole world of the evil men of influence and kings are preparing themselves to fight God. You see it right here? Revelation chapter 16. Now, the question is, or what we're really studying tonight in verse 14 and chapter 19, is Christ is coming, but he's not coming by himself. The Bible says in Revelation 19, 14, that there's an army coming with him. Y'all ready to look at it? So as we unload, as we unfold the identity of who's going to be the, the uh, this heavenly platoon, this this awesome group of divine troops, right? Let's start to unfold who is going to be with Christ. Now let's make something clear: if nobody's with them, he still outnumber them. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. But let's just look at it, right? Come on, come on, come with me. Come on, come on. The Bible gives us a clue on who's in this army. Look what it says. And the armies in heaven, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. Where have we seen that before? What? Where, where have we seen that description before? Come with me to Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse number 8. We studied this when we talked about the bride of the lamb, right? So who's going to be in the army? Look, look this is one group right here. Look at this. It says, let's start reading the verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be away. Here it is. In fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints the first clue here right the first group that's going to be in this army is us the church the bride of christ those who god has taken and to be with him and those who have uh, been washed in the blood of the lamb and prepared to enter into an eternal covenant with him the bible gives us a clue that the first group that we find is going to be in this army is indeed the bride is indeed the church clothed in fine linen bright and clean that's the first group right so what's the second group right here in revelation chapter 7 verse 9 here's another clue come here come with me revelation chapter 7 verse number 9 
this Bible study, y'all, we got to be going through the Bible. Revelation 7 and 9. The Bible says, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne before the Lamb, clothed, here it is, with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angel stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell to their faces before the throne, and worshipped him, saying, Amen, blessings, and glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders saying to me, Who are these people who are arrayed in these white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. So the first clue we got, huh? Come here. Revelation chapter 19 verse 8 tells us that the bride will be part of this army because they're clothed in white linen. Now we see that the tribulation saints, those who accepted Christ, those who were cleansed, and those who came out of the place of, of, of the tribulation period, that seven year period where the devil reigned, we see now that they come out of it, those who gave up their lives for Christ. They have their robes washed. So now we got the saints, right? The tribulation saints, and we got the church. Who else in the army? Come here. Let's go to Jude 14. Jude 14. It's next door to Revelation. It ain't too far. Here's what it says. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. What men? The Bible in Jude talks about men who are corrupt, men who are false prophets, men who have been influenced uh, and waiting to be judged, demons who have been waiting to be judged from the foundation of the world for the level of just blatant and wicked gross misconduct, gross sin. So it's talking about all these people, right? And so look what happens here in verse number 14. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. What are they going to do? Verse 15 tells us, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. If you look at this, this is really a reference to Hebrews chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 1 when the Bible says that Christ will come with the clouds. Not in the clouds, with the clouds. Now here's what's powerful here. If you look at the, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of all the heroes of faith in Old Testament history. You got Noah, it talks about uh, Rachel, it talks about Abraham, it talks about Moses, it talks about Joshua, it talks about all these Old Testament people who have been considered the heroes of faith. And then when you go to chapter 12, it says, now that we have been surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, meaning the Old Testament saints now. In this text here, we find that the Old Testament saints are going to be in the army executing judgment. We find that the tribulation saints are going to be executing uh, with Christ, coming with him. And we find that the church are going to be with Christ with him. So we see that these groups are with him. Are we missing a group? Yes, we are. There's one more group. There's one more group in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Yeah, buddy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me start reading at verse number 7. <clears throat> Uh, 
Let's start at verse number six. Since it is righteous that God repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, here it is, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of the power of his power. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you were believed. Here we are. Revelation chapter 19 verse 14 talks about the army. We have looked through scripture. We have found that the church, we found that the tribulation saints, we found that the Old Testament saints, we find here also the angels are all going to be part of this group that comes with Christ as he comes down for this final battle in Armageddon against the unholy trinity, Satan, the false prophet, and the antichrist. All of the kings from the east, all of the kings from the entire world, every demonic force that is on earth currently, we find that this is going to be a tremendous battle. But the good news here is that Christ has already won the battle. He's already victorious. He's already the king of kings and lord of lords can I say it one more again he is the king of everywhere and everybody so we find that all these people are here and Daniel chapter 12 really gives us some insight on that too we won't go into it but look at Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 when you oh, you're already at home right look at it though it's going to give you some more insight on this awesome time so now we see that the Bible says that all the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, they follow him on white horses. Stop right now before I move on to chapter verse 15. Let me stop right here. I want to give you a notice. In your notes, I want to help somebody here. Because what we find here, people who study Revelation and don't really have a, a pure and, and, a, and a very solid biblical context, this can get confusing, right? So let's stop right here. Let's help somebody. This situation that we're looking at here is not the same situation as the rapture of the church. In fact, this particular part of the scripture where we all calm down to reign with Christ would further solidify or reinforce biblically that the church has already been taken up. Can, can, can I give it to you? Let me give you the difference between the rapture and the return of Christ. Many people have, have merged those things together. Let me stop and teach for a second here. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to put it in the chat. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Please, everybody go there with us tonight. Let me just take a small detour to teach you something. Let me give you guys a second. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> let me show you something here. To let you know that this return of Christ is not the same as the rapture, and there's a distinct difference. These are two distinct different events, and I think I need to clarify that. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And here's what the word of God says, good people. Um, I start at verse 13. Right? But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Look at this. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this way, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Watch this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise for us. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Stop right there. That word caught up means harpa. 
Hazo, that's a, that's a Greek word, that means to be snatched away briskly. Uh, those of us who had a mama back in the day, you fell in sleep in church, you understand what harpazo mean. Those of you, when mama say, don't touch that candy in the stove, you know what harpazo mean. When, <laughs> when mama say, no, I don't care what you say, when we go to their house, don't be asking for nothing. And you mess around and ask for something, you know what harpazo mean. You didn't know your parents was being biblically sound when they was snatching your butt up when you did something crazy, right? Harpazo, right? That word is to be caught up. That's what that word means, right? So we see right here, right? Those that we caught up together with him in the clouds, the clouds are in the air, to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's a distinct difference between the tribulation, I mean, between the return of Christ, and what we're reading right now, and the time, listen to me, of the rapture. The Bible says very clearly that those who are in Christ, those who are saved, will be caught up, will be snatched up, will meet him in the air. Right? Because the Bible says in John 14 that he's going to prepare a place for us. Right? So you ought to understand, the first thing we see is that Christ does not come to earth. We meet him in the air. What we're looking at now, Christ is coming down to earth. This battle of Armageddon does not take place in space. It takes place here on earth. There's an exact geographical location where this battle will take place. And so the difference between the rapture where the church is being caught up is when the church is caught up and we'll be with him. But now this situation that we're reading is significantly different. Now we're not being caught up. We're actually coming down with him. Okay, so the return of Christ is when Christ literally sets foot on earth and make himself a kingdom. Let me give you some word. Matthew chapter 25. The Bible says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate them one from another as a, separ as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That takes place when Christ is here on earth. There are no goats in heaven. He's not separating sheep and goats in heaven. So understand something. What we're reading now is about the return of Christ, not the rapture of the church. The church is not going up in this text. The church is actually coming down. Y'all with me? Just wanted to give you that parenthetically, that, that, that really, really, 1 Thessalonians makes it very clear that it's nothing about judgment. It's about meeting Christ. It's about those who believe in Christ. Well, the lion is not coming for the believers. The lion is coming for the enemies. Remember, you got him when he was a lamb, so you're part of the bride of Christ. But if you did not get him uh, uh, when he was a lamb, you got to deal with the lion. And the lion is not coming for any conversation. He's not coming for any meetings. He's not coming for any uh, coffee. He's not coming to have little cucumber sandwiches with the edges cut off. He ain't coming for none of that. He's coming to execute judgment on those that have blatantly and repeatedly rejected him so that he may complete the salvation of those who love him. That's the purpose. Right? And so the Bible said that these people follow him on white horses. We understand that horses in the Bible talks about strength, uh, war, power, these horses that we're riding on is really a symbol, remember, of us reigning and ruling with God in his whole military outfit. The white, we understand that white is a symbol of purity. When you see horses and chariots in the Bible, for instance, when Elisha and, and, and um, Dothan were in that situation, he said, please open his eyes and see. It was a host of heavenly angels in heaven on horses and chariots. He said, those that are with us are more that are with them. You find when Elijah was taken up. He was taken up in a chariot of fire. So when you find horses in the Bible and chariots in the Bible symbolically, it's speaking of a divine, angelic work, a divine power, a divine work of God. And now we see that the king of God, the king of glory, on this white horse, right, is now have a host of people in the army riding with him. Symbolically is speaking of all of us going with him into this battle. And y'all excited about that. 
Now it's going to get glitter, right? Let's go to verse 15. So that's it. We, we, we recognize, we've identified those who are going to be part of this army. Look at verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will make them, remove them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. This is going to be so, so, so great. Let me give it to you like this. Have you ever seen uh, those movies that are about two hours long and the fight scene takes about an hour and a half, right? It's like they talk for 30 minutes and then the final scene is the next hour and a half of the movie, right? Well, the interesting thing about this battle of Armageddon is going to be instant, it's going to be swift, it's going to be quick. It ain't going to take a lot of time. I'm going to explain to you why that's the case. We're going to be coming to fight with him. Right? The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Now, the sword that comes out of his mouth is again another symbol. Okay, God is not, you know, some dude in the Seoul Olympics that's swallowing swords, you know. He's not, you know, Johnny Depp, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean with a sword in his mouth. It's a symbol of the slaying power of his word, meaning that the battle ain't going to take long because the weapon is sufficient. They're not going to be going back and forth. He's not going to have a struggle, leaning in, leaning out, and all this kind of stuff. The power of his word, the power of the word of God will be all that he needs to destroy every single wicked force, including Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. Can you push it some more? Let me push it. Let me push it. You ever had a situation coming up? I, I, I've had a couple. Well, you mess with the wrong person. You, 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 you tease one of the girls in the neighborhood. You tease a girl at school. And that girl got a crazy brother or a crazy cousin. A crazy uncle. They got somebody crazy who love to fight, who love to beat up people, who love contact, who love conflict, and they love defending their baby girl, their baby sister, their baby cousin, whoever the case may be. Now watch what's powerful about this. You mess with that girl. Watch, watch how this is working here. <laughs> she don't fight you. Kiki, whatever her name is, she don't fight you. What she do is go get her crazy brother, her crazy uncle, her crazy cousin, her crazy neighbor, her crazy play cousin, and then they come. Now watch what happens here. When they come and engage in conflict with the person that messed with her, they're doing the fighting. She's not. Watch where I'm taking you here. She's not doing the fighting. But she gets to enjoy the consequence of the victorious relative that defended her, that avenged her, that, that, that got the person who did her wrong back. Oh God, here it is, here it is. This is why I gave you that example. I wanted to show you a picture now of all these people that are going to be riding with Christ, that are going to be uh, in, this, in this heavenly platoon with Christ as the king. But let me tell you something. We are there, but we are not fighting. Is that, jack is that crazy? I'm going to show you in the scripture. We are there. Listen here. We're not fighting. Look what the Bible says. The sword is came out of his mouth. Look, right here, right here. It says, out of his mouth was a sharp sword. And with it, he will strike the nations. And he will make, a, he will rule with a rod, a rod of iron. And he himself, look at the word, treads the wine press. When you mess with a child of God, all of the wickedness that has been going on, that has been impacting the people of God, now Christ is going to come back and avenge them. That's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine. That's why Christ is coming back. Now, the sword that comes from his mouth is different from the sword that we notice in Hebrews chapter 4, when the Bible says that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. This sword is a uh, makara sword. This sword is used for nice cutting, precision, like when the Bible says a, a workman rightfully dividing, cutting straight. It's really divine to cut things. It's a surgical tool. This knife that, that it speaks of, the sword that it speaks of is a, really like a, like a big knife uh, and it's used for cutting. Uh, uh, when the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 that your weapon is a sword, a 
of the sword is the word of God. Understand, that speaks of the word of God's defensive work. The sword is also an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. Whenever you see some people fencing, you see them fighting with a sword, you poke with the sword, but then you also keep them getting poked with the sword, right? So in this text right here, it's speaking not in that way. This is not a defensive weapon. This is not a small surgical tool. When we talk about the sword that's coming from the mouth of God, it's talking about a huge thrashing sword. This sword is used for whacking and thrusting things. It is a big broad sword that is used for fighting. He's not trying to cut anything straight. He's not trying to be careful. He's not trying to separate anything. He's using his word to slay every evil and every demonic and every wicked force so that he may reign as king and take his rightful place. Look what the Bible says. Can I push it some more? Look at here. There is power in the word of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Right here in your notes. You don't got to go far. The Bible says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. You will see the weapon of mass destruction will be the sword that comes from Christ's mouth. And what is that sword? That sword is the word of Christ. Christ's words will be what destroys all wickedness. That's why the battle ain't going to take long. That's why it ain't going to be all day. That's why they ain't going to be sitting there struggling and fighting and all that. His word is going to slay them. It's going to be instant. It's going to be quick because his word is powerful. That's why when the man said, look at here. Yeah, I don't need you to come to my house, God. You just speak the word. That's why when he says, nevertheless, God, at that word, we'll cast the nets down. Huh. That's why he told the woman, go and sin no more. Christ can speak his word. And just as he spoke all things into existence, the Bible says the power of life and death lies in the tongue. Well, that also applies to Christ. He is the word. And if he curse a fig tree, baby, that fig tree's cursed. If he says it's over with, it's over with. So now we see that the powerful word of God, the weapon of Christ, the sword that comes from his mouth, is what's going to be the weapon of mass destruction. That's why he's the only one with the weapon and we're not. We're the girl who's watching <laughs> huh? our cousin who's in the fight take care of the one who messed with us. We're not in the fight. Let me put you some more. This is why we're not in the fight. I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, we're not in the fight and if you think we should be in the fight, then you're under the false conclusion that this battle is just as much yours as God's. Um, this is Christ's battle. He's the only one who's sinless. He's the only one who is the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the only one who has power and authority to fight and destroy the works of the wicked one. It is not about your fight. This is his fight. That's why, number one, you don't have no weapon. You don't have no business fighting. I don't have no business fighting. We don't have the power without Christ. And that's the issue. The second and most prolific reason why we don't have a weapon, and he's the only one who fights, is if we had a weapon and had to fight too, then philosophically it will tell you that he needs help. We know clearly one is not our battle, and for sure he don't need help. Because of the power of the weapon that he's using now on this unrepentant, blasphemous, angry, negative, deeply rooted, wicked people that he's fighting against. If the world ain't enough, then there ain't no bigger weapon. So now we see Christ here. Don't need our help. And it ain't our fight. So we reign with him, even though he's the only one that's carrying the weapon. Isn't it interesting when you watch movies like Independence Day or Godzilla, all these movies, whenever you see the enemy looking at it, they just shoot at it. Oh, they just, they, 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 they're, their answer to everything is shoot at it. Shoot missiles at it. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. That's all they want to do. Well, guess what? These kings from the east, these kings from the world, these kings from the earth, these kings that are under the influence of the unholy trinity, they're only going to have weapons, but the 
problem with their weapons is that their weapons are going to be natural. They're going to have probably big giant cannons and super high caliber weapons and all that is nothing because the word of God will destroy them instantaneously and they can shoot, they can do whatever they want. They can have the most high profile, the most expensive weapons possible. It will be no match for Christ who will speak the word and it will be so. So imagine he's going to speak judgment and it's going to be so. He's going to speak destruction on the wicked and it's going to be so. There's going to be a rap. It's going to be a done deal. And all we do is get the reign with him and watch him fight. We don't fight in the fight. We just reign with him. We don't fight for him. We reign with him. Him. The Bible says that we will be kings and priests and we will be a kingdom. The Bible says that we will be able to reign with him. He is doing the fighting alone and he don't need any help. Don't believe me? Let me read it one more time. It says, his mouth goes a sharp sword. It says, he will strike the nations. The Bible says, he will rule with a rod of iron. The Bible says, he himself will tread the wine press. There ain't no us in this fight. There's one king and one weapon, and that's all he needs. We just ride with him, but we don't fight for him. You need some word, don't you? All right, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Look at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. And then I'll get to the last verse and let you go tonight. Joel chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 2, then verse 13 through 17. This is what verse 2 says. I will also gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. See, the people are the one who he's avenging. They're not fighting with him. He says, I'm doing this. My heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and whom they have divided up amongst my land. Look at verse 13, Joel chapter 3. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is right. Come. Go down. Look at this. For the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will go dark, and all the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion. Oh, God, I said that too fast. Ain't that a nice little pretty little Lion King reference that's nice and tucked in the middle of the scripture? It says, for the Lord will also roar from Zion. That's what kings do. And utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be a shelter for his people. And the strength of the children of Israel. Again, he's the one is fighting. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Dwelling in the Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. And no alien shall never pass through her again. Pretty please, can I give you another one? Isaiah chapter 63. That was Joel chapter 3. It's in your notes. So don't be like he's going fast. It's in your notes. Isaiah 63. Let me just read this. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And we'll go to verse 16 and let you go. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments of Bozrah? We read this last week. But watch this. This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak righteous. Mighty to save. This is nothing about us. This is all me, my, I. Look. Why is your pearl red and your garments like the one who treads in the wine press? Look what Christ says. Look what God says. I have tried in the wine press alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have tried in them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed 
have come. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought me salvation for me. And my own fury, it sustained me. Y'all see it in the word very clearly from Isaiah chapter 63 and Joel chapter 3. That this whole battle, this whole revenge, this whole avenging uh, campaign, he's doing it alone. We don't fight with him. We just reign with him. He does the fighting and his word is the weapon. We'll talk about it a little bit more as we keep going. So let's go to verse 16 and let it go there. <laughs> oh, God, what are we talking about? Can I say something? Ain't it awesome to be in a fight that you ain't got to fight the win? Ain't it awesome that you really ride on the horse and, and you're riding with him and you ain't got to worry about any kind of... His word is the only weapon that's needed. Thanks be to God for that, man. Who wouldn't want to serve a king like that? Hmm. Look at verse 16. I got to let you go. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We talked about this last week, how Christ have many crowns, many diadems. And we looked into the scripture. We saw the Antichrist, and he had many crowns too. We had 10 crowns to be specific. What we find here is this phrase is indicating the sovereignty of God and the universal rule of God. It would be interesting if he was king of peasants or kings of citizens and lord of other citizens, right? Then that would mean whoever is a king somewhere else, Christ don't rule them. But it says that he is king of kings. That means if you are a king, typically you have a domain. And typically in your domain, you only are considered the dominant figure within the parameters of your domain. Right? Once you step out of your domain, you're no longer the king. That's why Boss Hogg could never get the dukes when they got out of state lines or, or county lines because Boss Hogg didn't have jurisdiction once the dukes got... That, that, that's, why, that's why he does not have jurisdiction. Now, once they get back into his county, now Boss Hogg got something to say. Y'all see, you know, dukes and hazard, y'all know Boss Hogg. Right? There's a, there's a limit and a jurisdictional uh, limit a barrier to a king's rule. But when you talk about Christ who is the king of kings and lord of lords, it means that there is no jurisdictional boundary. There is no limit. His kingship is un in, he's not, uh, he's not up for impeachment. He can't be moved. He can't be outvoted. Why? Because there's no one who is above him. So everyone who has influence, everyone who has power, everyone who has a domain must yield to the power. I think the word put it this way. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. So now we see that this banner on his thigh, when it talks about on his robe, it's a sash that he wears, it's a banner that he has, right? Psalm 95 and 3 says, he is a great God and a great king above all gods. Even Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, he says it this way. He says, man, that God you serve is the God of all the gods. There is something about understanding who he is, right? So let's look at this really quickly. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 14, and we'll let you go right here. We'll start to land the plane right here in Zechariah chapter 14. I'm going to show you something. He rules over every king and every ruler. The sash is on his thigh. Indicates that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. Let's go to Zechariah 14. I'll begin reading at verse number 3 to 9 and then 16 to 20 and then we'll be done. Zechariah 14. This is what verse 3 says. Then the Lord will go forth 
and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of battle, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move towards the north, and half shall move towards the south. Then you shall, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with him. It shall come to pass in that day that there should be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at even time it shall happen that it will be the light. And in that day it shall be that living waters flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea, both in summer and winter it will occur. And the Lord shall be king over all of the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. This is his millennial reign, y'all. The Lord of hosts and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that don't come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that holy day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved in the barrels of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the barrels before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifice shall come and take them and cook in them. And in that day, there shall no longer be Canaanite in the house of the Lord. Why did I read you that? Because it's talking about all of his enemies and everybody that's against him. Watch this. Still have to be accountable for him as the king. They still have to acknowledge him as the king. Psalm 2 talks about how he's going to rule with a rod of iron and all the nations have to bow before him and honor him as king. And it pleased God for Christ to inherit the nations and the kingdoms of this earth. That everyone must acknowledge Christ as the king. Even those who are kings in their own right have to submit to the rule of Christ. Why? Because he's king of kings and lord of of lords. And when we come to reign as the king and the lord of all things, there will be a certain level of peace. There will be a certain level of stability. There will be a certain level of blessings. That's what the Bible says in Job chapter 3. It says, where the wicked will cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest, there will be an awesome time there when Christ comes and set up his kingdom. He'll be king of kings and lord of lords. And no one will be able to defy his rulership, overthrow him. There's no coups. There's no overthrowing him. There's no moving him. There's no uh, intricate plots to get him out. There's no crew. There's no clan. There's no team. There's no special force that's going to move him out. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. It's written on him. Name's word of God. The name is King of King and Lord of Lords. Listen, as we get ready to wrap this up, um, I want you to kind of really pay attention to the flow of this text next, right? So next week we're going to get into verse number 17. And verse number 17 is going to begin to describe this battle of Armageddon, this battle between the forces of righteousness and the forces of wickedness. And what we learn and what we read in our scripture, in our text, right, that Christ himself is the king, that we will reign with him, and we will rule with him, but we don't have to fight for him. And we're going to see how quickly and instantaneously this thing goes. Verses 17 to 20 the text 
right? 21, verse 17 to 21, ends the chapter. And we move right into the thousand year reign of Christ. This is going to be a very powerful, powerful thing. Because we get an idea of Armageddon, and we think Armageddon is some long, drawn out battle where they're struggling, like, this is Sparta, this is not, this is not 300. No, this is a very quick, instantaneous battle. We're going to turn, we're going to turn to 17 next week and look at it. So that's our lesson tonight. Um, the plan is coming together. We'll be in the army with him. We'll be a heavenly troop. Won't get not an ounce of dirt in the uniform. <laughs> Our robe, look, we'll go into the fight with a white robe. We'll come out with a white robe. We'll go into the fight victorious. We'll come out victorious. Right? The sword, the weapon of mass destruction, the word of God will slay all of his enemies. And if you look at Revelation 14 and other biblical texts, we don't have time to get into it, but the Bible gets very graphic. It says that the blood from his word, that the symbolism of how, how ferocious is going to be. The Bible says it will go up to the horse's bridle. It will go up in some places four feet high from all the slashing and thrashing he's going to do with this word. It's so it was powerful imagery. Matter of fact, I'm going to find that text. I'm, 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 I'm going to bring it to you guys next week just to read for your own because it's powerful imagery how he's just, he just going to have blood all the way up to here and he's not going to have any natural weapon. It's going to be his word. I was says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, if you're out here tonight, and if you have any questions on our lesson, um, anything that you want to ask, anything that you want clarity on, um, you can type your answer in uh, right here, and I will be glad to answer any of your questions if there's anybody with us. Okay, I just got noticed there's something wrong with the sound. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with the sound. I don't know why. It's, I don't know. Um, any questions or comments? Or anybody have any questions for our sound tonight? I mean, for our for our lesson tonight. Um, we'll go from there. So next week, I hope you have this issue fixed. I just realized that you guys send notes about the sound. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It doesn't sound like that in here. So um, we'll see. We'll see what we can do to to rectify that. So let's pray. Um, there's somebody that would like to know who Jesus Christ is. We'd like to offer them salvation at this time, offer them an opportunity to uh, get to know who Christ is. Um, if that is you at this time, um, we'd like to give you Christ. Um, it's very simple. You just admit that you are a sinner. And acknowledge the fact that he came to die on the cross for you. And if that is the case, you, my brother, you, my sister, are saved. It's that simple. It's not a deep or complicated process. It is uh, very simple. It seems too good to be true. It's not. It's Christ offering you an opportunity to meet the Lamb and not the lion. Um, as you can see, and as we walk through this battle time, uh, that the lion is not playing around. 
Um, it's going to be a very quick battle, uh, verses 17 to 21, which we'll study next week. So that's shooting of desire of salvation. Please let it be known um, right here in the chat, and we'll be able to talk with you and walk with you through the plan of salvation. All you got to do, let it be known. We'll walk with you through this plan. Any questions on tonight's lesson? Um, any questions or comments tonight that anybody would like answered? I will be here for a period of time. And um, we'll be moving forward. So if you have anything, I'll be here for a couple minutes just to wait and see if you have any questions or comments for tonight. We'll be back in Revelation chapter 19, verse 17. Next week, we will start to talk about the battle of Armageddon. We have identified Christ as the captain, as the rider of the white horse. We have identified the people of God, the church, tribulation saints, the Old Testament saints, and the angels who are going to be with him. And um, God, Christ is going to make very quick work of the enemy. Again, I apologize for the sound. I don't know what, what, what I don't know what the cause is. I don't know. But um, we will get that fixed. God bless you all. Um, you guys all have an awesome rest of your evening and we will see you tomorrow for power prayer uh, take care and if you want to go back and look at some previous studies to kind of give you um, run and start on next week go ahead and do that you want to read ahead go ahead and do that I encourage you to stay in the word God bless you all love you all and have an awesome rest of your day